All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Central Texas Mycological Society monthly guest speaker series. And tonight we're super excited to have Barbara Thiers, Dr. Barbara Thiers. She is from the uh, Steer Herbarium in Bronx, New York. Uh, it's affiliated with the New York Botanical Society. And she's responsible for overseeing uh, 7.9 million collections of algae, uh, bryophytes, fungi, and vascular plants. And tonight she is going to talk about George Washington Carver's contribution to the fungi kingdom. And, you know, we all know about George Washington Carver's contribution to soil science, but he was fascinated by fungi like many of us are. And so she is. Uh, we're so honored to have her with us to share a presentation she put together just for our society. And we hope that this, this spreads and we all learn about uh, his vast, the vast contributions that he made. Um, and Barbara is also going to share tonight a little bit about uh, a book that just came out about the importance of these type of collections and um, and so she'll spend some time on that tonight too. So with that, uh, thank you so much for uh, presenting to our society and take it away. Okay, um, get my screen share going here. All right, so good evening. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you all tonight. And thank you so much to Angel and the Central Texas Mycological Society for inviting me. I hope that all of you in Texas have recovered from your storm and power outages back in February when we were supposed to have this program. Um, sounds like things were pretty awful for many of you. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about George Washington Carver and his contribution to mycology. I'm neither a mycologist nor a historian, so there are certainly others who could talk to you more authoritatively about the life and accomplishments of Carver and about the particular fungi he studied. But I do have some insight to share with you on the subject through my career as a herbarium curator. I'll be talking to you, as Angel said, about herbaria as well in connection to Carver and their more general role in understanding our world. But first, a bit more about me. My father, Harry D. Tears, was a mycologist. He grew up on the Edwards Plateau near Junction, Texas, in a very tiny community called Roosevelt. For several generations, his family had eked out a meager living from the beautiful but water-starved land in that area. My dad, however, was happy to leave that behind. He was able to attend the University of Texas on a scholarship and then did his PhD work at the University of Michigan. His first professional position was at Texas A&M and I was born in College Station. Then he took a teaching job at San Francisco State University and spent the next 40 years studying fungi of California, publishing several books on California mushrooms and building a collection of dried fungi that documented his research and that of his many students. So I grew up with fungi. My childhood weekends were spent either on collecting trips or helping my dad prepare the fungi we collected to store in his herbarium, which is what we call a collection of dried plants or fungi. Some people use the term fungarium for a collection of just fungi, but my dad's also included flowering plants, bryophytes, and algae, so I use the more general term. Once I came under the thrall of teenage rebellion, I wanted nothing more to do with the herbarium or my parents for that matter. But in the middle of my college years, I found my way back. I discovered that I too wanted to participate in the great adventure of documenting plant and fungal life and to join my dad and his passionate, often eccentric band of students and colleagues who derived such joy from this work. I didn't exactly follow my dad's career path. I studied bryophytes, that's mosses and re related plants, instead of fungi for my PhD research. But I st did stick with the herbarium theme. After graduate school, I took a job at the New York Botanical Garden, working in the garden steer herbarium. The New York Botanical Garden was founded in the Bronx, which is the northernmost borough of New York City, in 1986. 
1896, sorry, on one of the last remaining tracts of forest that existed within the city limits. The aim of the institution were aims were to carry out research on American plants and fungi, to educate the public about those same organisms, and to provide a green oasis in a congested metropolis. Working in the New York Botanical Garden Herbarium was quite a different experience than working in my dad's. Whereas his collection contained about 100,000 specimens focused almost entirely on California, the garden's herbarium has almost 8 million specimens, making it the third largest in the world and a major source of plant and fungal diversity for research projects all over the world. What this slide shows is our main museum building, kind of the grand building that used to house the herbarium and still houses my office, which is approximately over here. Um, this is the herbarium building, which is attached to the left-hand side of the building you see here where all the collections are stored. And this is a view inside. What you see are rows of compactor units that herbarium cabinets, steel cabinets are mounted on. And then inside the cabinets are the specimens. Here are selections of specimens and here is a typical herbarium specimen of a plant where we have the dried and pressed plant and then a label in the, always in the lower right hand corner that tells what it was, where it was collected, by whom, when, and so forth. Because they're fundamental to the story of George Washington Carver's involvement with her mycology, I'm going to take a minute to give some background on herbaria. Scientists have been documenting the plants and fungi of the world through herbaria for about six centuries. The basic preparation of the specimens um, that are housed in herbarium have changed relatively little over time, but the invention of this simple technology was a key innovation in transforming the study of these organisms from a minor sub-discipline of medicine into an independent scientific endeavor. The herbarium made it possible for scientists to characterize the plants and fungi that grow in faraway places and to understand their diversity on a global scale. Our wealth of specimens today, so carefully preserved through the centuries, is a unique source of data that help us understand how the world's vegetation has changed over time and to predict how it will change in the future. Evidence suggests that this man, shown here, Luca Ghini, created the first herbarium. He was from the region around Bologna, Italy. He lived at a time when the Renaissance was starting to blossom in Northern Italy and Northern forward-looking universities in the region encount, um, encouraged independent thought and new ideas and goods came from travelers passing en route from Northern Europe to the Mediterranean in the Middle East. After graduating from the University of Bologna with a medical degree, Gini was hired there as a professor. Instead of relying purely on classical texts such as Dioscorides Materia Medica, Gini encouraged his students to make independent observations of the plants he collected for their study. He maintained these reference specimens as dried, pressed and dried plants that were glued to bound pages of a book. Later, he went on to create the first botanical garden in the city of Pisa, where he, when he moved on to teach at the university there. Like the herbarium, the aim of the garden was also to aid in the teaching of botany. Botanists came from all over Europe to visit Guinea and they adopted the herbarium technique to aid in their plant study. Guinea's herbarium has not survived, but some of, those, some of his students' herbaria still exist and some examples of their collections are shown here. As I mentioned earlier, herbaria contain not just vascular plants, but also algae, bryophytes, and fungi, including lichens. Most of the 16th century botanists largely ignored these organisms because it wasn't until the microscope was invented that their life histories could be understood. Also, both mushrooms and algae may decay very quickly after collection and are difficult to preserve. However, a few bryophytes and lichens and the occasional alga can be found among the pages of the earliest herbaria. In all these groups, the features that are key for understanding their life histories are too small to view with the human eye alone, which inhibited an understanding of their relationships to other organisms. In fact, because of the inability to see the reproductive structures in these organisms, they were often referred to as cryptogams, which means in Latin and Greek, hidden gametes or hidden sex organs. The earliest herbaria that focused on fungi, the earliest herbarium that focused on fungi was that of Per Antonio Michelli. Michelli, uh, a 
from Florence was the first to describe reproduction in fungi, and thus he's often considered the founder of mycology, the study of fungi, and is also known for his pioneering studies of bryophytes and lichens. His herbarium, which also contains that of his students, is maintained at the University of Florence and contains about 19,000 specimens. The New York Botanical Garden has a large collection of herbarium specimens of cryptogams, and I spent the early years of my career managing this part of the herbarium. And here are some examples of those organisms. We have a marine alga, which is pressed and glued to paper. Um, fungi, which are we usually store dried and either in a packet or a box, they aren't pressed or anything. And then bryophytes, which in this case, the specimen is actually pressed, but usually they are just loose in a paper packet with a label on the outside call your attention to the stamp on this box, um, which indicates that this collection came to the garden from the DePau, DePau University herbarium. Um, it's not uncommon for herbaria to move around over the years. Since I've been at the garden, we've acquired specimens from a variety of other institutions that no longer want to maintain some or all of their collection. In the case of DePau, they gave us their entire herbarium in 1987. And a few years later, we were given the fungal collections from Wellesley College. And while we were incorporating the fungi from Wellesley College, one of my curatorial assistants came across this specimen. What we see here is a small packet um, that indicates it is a specimen of fun fungus called Perinosporum al alcinierum, which was collected in Tuskegee, Alabama by a G.W. Carver in 1906. Inside the packet is a bit of leaf of Cerastium vulgatum, or snow in summer, with some dusty looking spots on it, which are the fungus, probably asexual spores. When I saw this specimen, I remembered that a few years earlier, I had read a children's biography of George Washington Carver with my daughter for a Black History Month project, and it contained a rather vague statement about Carver having an interest in fungi. I was intrigued by that, but didn't really follow up. So after we found this specimen, I started looking into it and I discovered that yes, indeed, the specimen was collected by George Washington Carver. I wrote a blog about it and then I republished it in a new format about 10 years later. That's the one that's shown here. In the meantime, a variety of other herbaria discovered that they too had specimens of fungi collected by Carver. The main reason many of us were so intrigued by the fact that Carver collected fungi is that of course he's famous for something completely different, for popularizing the peanut as a crop, a foodstuff, and many other products ranging from insulation to shaving cream. The popular image of Carver is sort of a wacky creative genius who managed through his hard work and ingenuity as a black man in the Jim Crow South to be very successful. And while there is great admiration and even reverence for this man, um, he, his contributions to documenting fungal diversity is almost never mentioned. But mycology was an important part of Carver's life. And considering this part of his life gives us a fuller picture of this most remarkable man. Carver was born a slave about 1865 on a plantation belonging to a Moses Carver in Diamond Grove, Missouri, just about the time of the emancipation proclamation that freed the slaves, at least in principle. He was orphaned at a very young age. His father died in an accident before he was born. Carver's mother and sister were kidnapped when he was an infant. Carver, Carver was recovered, but his mother and sister were never seen again. So he and his elder brother were raised by the Carver family and adopted their name. Chronic ill health as a child kept, Jar kept George away from hard farm labor. He worked in the house and in the garden, and this is where he developed his love of plants. Since he was clearly academically talented, the Carver family sought educational opportunities for him, and they arranged for him to attend an elementary school for African-American children in Neosho, Missouri. And later, he continued his education in Minneapolis, Kansas, where he received a high school diploma. After completing high school, he lived in various places in the Midwest. We do not know a lot about what he did in those years, but he moved from place to place fairly often. While working in a hotel in Winterset, Iowa, he was befriended by a white couple, John and Helen Milholland, who push, pers pushed him to pursue a college degree. He took their advice and enrolled in Simpson College in Indianola, Iowa, 
at the and at the age of 26, he walked the 27 miles from Winterset to Indianola to begin his college education. Simpson College was endowed by a Matt Simpson, who was a friend of Abraham Lincoln and an advocate for equal rights. Carver was one of the first African-American students to attend. The enrollment fee was $12, which he paid and left him exactly 10 cents to his name. He spent the 10 cents on suet and cornmeal to sustain him until he could find a job. But ever resourceful, before long, he had set himself up doing laundry for students and others at the college. He thrived at Simpson and later said, it was at Simpson that I first realized I was a human being. Carver's objective was to study music and painting, and this brought him into contact with an art professor named Etta Budd, shown here. Professor Budd believed Carver was a talented painter, but she did not encourage him to pursue a career in the arts. She thought his career opportunities would be much better in science and convinced Carver to reorient his educational goals. Through her father, a professor of agriculture at Iowa State College, she helped arrange for Carver to transfer to that institution. Carver was the first African-American to enroll in the Iowa State College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts, now known as Iowa State University. He excelled in his studies and entered fully into campus life. He was leader in the YMCA and debate team. He was the captain, the highest student rank of the campus military regiment. His poetry was published in the college newspaper and two of his paintings were exhibited at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. He paid for his education by working in the dining room and also as an athletic trainer. He wrote an undergraduate thesis about plant hybridization and um, based on the quality of that work, he was encouraged to stay on for graduate studies after he completed his bachelor's degree. When he entered the graduate program, he also became a member of the family with the family, a member of the faculty with the title of assistant botanist and became the first African-American faculty member in addition to the first un African-American undergraduate and graduate student. Harvard's graduate work was based at the Iowa State College Experiment Station, which was located near Ames. Um, land grant colleges like Iowa State always had an experiment station as a way to fulfill a congressional charge to bring scientific advances to the farmers of the state. And it was during his time at the experiment station that Carver developed his skill in plant pathology and mycology. One of his chief mentors was a faculty member named Lewis H. Pamel, who had been trained in botany and mycology and was the first person to discover and identify the fungus that caused root rot in cotton. He was also an early ecologist and conservationist and a proponent of environmental education, and he helped establish actually several state parks in Iowa. Pamel was more than just a faculty advisor to Carver. He helped Carver buy a suit when he participated in a statewide art exhibition. He also bought Carver his first microscope. They remained friends until the end of Pamel's life, and Carver continued to correspond with Pamel's family long after that. Carver collected quite a few fungi during his years in Iowa, mostly plant pathogens. The Iowa State University Herbarium holds about 200 specimens of his from the area around Ames, and one of these is shown here. Pamel wrote to a colleague that Carver was the best collector in the department that I've ever known. And we have a, we have a, a quote um, from Carver about his collecting and his experience. The quote on this slide gives some indication of how he approached collecting fungi. I think we can all relate to that experience where after you've been introduced to something in the landscape that you were previously unaware of, we start to see it everywhere. Carver completed his master's degree in agriculture from Iowa State in 1896. I have not been able to find the title, but it was on some aspect of plant pathology. He also co-authored several papers with Pamel during his graduate student years. Carver had many job offers after he completed his master's degree, but he decided to accept a, a position at the Tuskegee Institute. At, in 1897 at the invitation of President Booker T. Washington. The Institute had been founded on the 4th of July in 1881 as the Tuskegee Normal School for Colored Teachers. The following year, Washington bought the grounds of an adjacent former plantation and used this land to expand the Institute in the decades that followed. 
In addition to training teachers, Tuskegee also taught the practical skills needed for students to succeed at farming and other trades typical of the rural South, where most of the students were from. As part of their work study programs, students constructed most of the buildings on campus and others earned all or parts of their expenses doing agricultural domestic work associated with campus. Carver was hired as head of the newly formed Department of Agriculture at Tuskegee, Inst and he, Tuskegee Institute, and he was also put in charge of its agricultural experiment station, which like the Iowa State uh, Extension um, Station, was charged with providing assistance to local farmers. Carver was delighted with the position because as he wrote to Washington, it has always been the one ideal of my life to be the greatest good to the greatest number of my people. Agricultural education is the key to unlock the golden doors of freedom for our people. It was somewhat of an unpleasant surprise to Carver that he was expected to teach a full load of courses in addition to establishing the agriculture department and managing the experiment station. But Washington was unwilling to consider a lesson of teaching load. Because of this and other sources of conflict, the two men apparently had a pretty uneasy relationship through most of their time together at Tuskegee. Despite the enormity of his responsibilities at Tuskegee, Carver immediately began to explore the fungal diversity in central Alabama. From some of Carver's correspondence, it appears that Pamel had encouraged him to make a study of Alabama puffballs, but this is, does not appear to have happened. Carver preferred to look for leaf spots and other type of fungi on plants, exercising his keen powers of observation. Very soon after his arrival in Tuskegee, Carver became acquainted with a man named Franklin Sumner Earl, who was the chairman of biology and horticulture at the Alabama Polytechnic Institute in Auburn. And Carver began to contribute to the compendium of, of Alabama fungi that Earl was preparing with New York Botanical Garden botanist and mycologist Lucian Underwood. Consequently, a number of Carver's specimens are cited in the resulting publication a preliminary list of Alabama fungi. For some species, carvers are the only one collection cited, suggesting that without carver's attention to detail, some of the fungal diversity rec recorded in this publication might have been missed. Um, most of the records he contributed were, were of pathogenic fungi. In 1901, Earl left Auburn to become the first mycologist at the New York Botanical Garden. It was probably Carver's ability as a fungal collector to the attention of Job Bicknell Ellis. Ellis was the first American student of fungal plant diseases. Um, born in Potsdam, New York, Ellis attended Union College in Schenectady, but after serving in the U Union Army during the Civil War, settled in Newfield, New Jersey, where he lived for the rest of his life. He developed a fascination with fungi and devoted devo most of his time to their study. He built the first major private herbarium of fungi in the United States and described more than 4,000 new species. Ellis and Carver began a collaboration and Carver sent Ellis many valuable specimens for identification. At one point, Ellis sent Carver a three page commentary on the specimens he sent and in it, Ellis wrote, glad to, have, glad to have you put in all the notes and figures of spores with measurements and to give names as far as you can, it all helps. The names you've given are in this lot are mostly correct. This comment shows that Carver provided the level of documentation for his specimens that a professional mycologist would be expected to provide when sending specimens to a colleague for consultation. This is a point I'll return to later. In 1902, Ellis published an article with Benjamin Everhart titled New Alabama Fungi, which included 60 new species based on Carver's collections. In addition to sharing the products of his mycological research through publications, Ellis also distributed some of Carver's specimens in his Exocati. Exocati is a Latin word meaning dried thing, which could be applied to any herbarium specimen, but the term has a special meaning in botany, referring to one or more sets of specimens that could be offered for sale like a book. In fact, some Exocati were indeed bound into books. An Exocati might focus on a particular type of organism or a, ge ge or a geographic area. By the end of the 19th century, it had become common for a collector to finance their trips by selling sets of Exocati to subscribers who might include amateur botanists as well as directors of institutional herbaria. 
It was very much more common among cryptogamic organisms, which required, which required specialized knowledge and sometimes specialized collecting techniques. Exocati were given titles, usually in Latin, and specimens were numbered sequentially, with each number representing a single gathering from which duplicate specimens were prepared, so that theoretically each set would have identical comments, contents. That didn't always work out that way. They, there is some variation among them. Ellis produced three different exocati, fungal exocati titles, uh, the, the titles of which are listed above. Um, these were very widely distributed among U.S. herbaria and also in European collections as well. It was in the Fungi Columbiani Exocati where Carver's specimens were distributed. And this is why today Carver's collections are found in a wide range of herbaria across North America and Europe. Some of the specimens Ellis can, uh, distributed in his Exocati had actually been collected while Carver was in graduate school in Iowa. He apparently brought his specimens with him to Tuskegee with the intention of starting his own herbarium. However, he was not given suitable space to house such a collection, and many of his specimens were destroyed when there was a water leak in the building where they were stored. Despite repeated requests, he was not given an alternate location to safely store his specimens. So it seems that he thought that he thought that by teaming up with Ellis to distribute his specimens, that this would be the best way that he had to assure that they would be preserved and studied. Carver's immediate contribution to an understanding of the fungi of Alabama and his collaboration with prominent mycologists of the day are all the more impressive when we consider that this was not the focus of his work. As I mentioned earlier, his primary responsibilities were to teaching students and through the experiment station to the farmers of the region. Tuskegee is located in what's known as the Black Belt region of Alabama, which is indicated here in red. The term originally referred to the region's rich black topsoil, but it took on an additional meaning in the 19th century when the region was developed for cotton plantation and agriculture in which the workers were enslaved African Americans. After the Civil War, many freedmen stayed in the area as sharecroppers and tenant farmers, continuing to comprise a majority of the population in many of these counties. Upon arrival, Carver instantly realized the scope of the challenge he faced in his extension work. He wrote, when my train left the golden wheat fields and tall green corn of Iowa for the acres of cotton, nothing but cotton, my heart sank a little. The scraggly cotton grew close up to the cabin doors, a few lonesome collards, the only sign of vegetables, stunted cattle, bony mules, fields and hillsides cracked and scarred with gullies and deep ruts, not much evidence of scientific farming anywhere. Everything looked hungry, the land, the cotton, the cattle, and the people. He readily identified the fundamental problem as monocrop farming, Cotton depleted the soil, which led to erosion and a failure of other crops to thrive, affecting the health of livestock and ultimately the farmers. He realized that he faced a major, major educational challenge in getting farmers to change their practices and devote more effort to building and feeding the soil and developing expertise with other types of crops. They could rotate with cotton. Not easy to do because cotton had been the major cash crop for a century at least, and this was where the farmer's equipment and expertise were, was focused. The challenge was made all the more difficult because Carver was an outsider. Being raised in the Midwest, he had a different accent, different mannerisms and customs, and was not immediately trusted by the Black Belt farmers. In pursuit of the goal of developing more sustainable farming methods, Carver introduced the idea of crop rotation. He wanted to coax farmers away from growing only cotton and instead towards growing self-enhancing protein-rich crops such as sweet potatoes, cow peas, and peanuts. And of course, in order to convince him to grow these crops, he had to demonstrate that there'd be a market for them. One method he chose for introducing crops was through the production of bulletins, short publications in non-technical language that were freely distributed to the farmers. Some of these are shown here. The bulletins included cultivation techniques, plant disease management strategies, and recipes. Sweet potatoes were the crop he chose to champion first because more bush bushels could be raised per acre than any other crop with less injury to soil. And of course, they're highly nutritious and versatile. He championed cow peas and peanuts because both of these legumes form associations in their root with nitrogen fixing bacteria that return nitrogen, a key plant nutrient, nutrient to the soil. 
These plants, when done producing crops, could be plowed into the soil to replenish it. Commercial fertilizers were beginning to be available in this time, but at a cost far beyond the reach of most of the farmers he served. So he focused on training them to use materials at hand as compost to build the soil. In addition to conducting research on which crops could help restore the soil and produce lucrative and, and um, nutritious crops to rotate with carton, cotton, Carver made direct outreach to local farmers. He invited them to send sample of soils, fertilizers, or insect pests to the station for analysis and urged every farmer within reach to visit our station frequently and come in more direct touch with us. The bulletins he produced extended beyond how to grow crops, but also included topics such as nature study for rural schools and how to use native clays to make attractive homewares and paint. He also took the experiment station to the people using the Jessup agricultural wagon, the, origin, uh, the original one of which is shown here. The Jessup wagon was a mobile classroom that allowed Carver to do demonstrations for farmers on cultivation, harvest, and preparation of food crops and how to build healthy soil. The wagon's name originated from Morris Jessup, a New York banker who financed the project. However, it was Carver himself who designed the wagon, selected the equipment, and developed the lessons for the farmers. The original horse-drawn carriage was later replaced by a truck. The successful outreach model was widely adopted by the USDA. Mobile vehicles continue to be used today by organizations like the Alabama Cooperative Extension Service System. Carver once said, my work is that of conservation. And this is the title of an environmental biography of Carver by historian Mark Hershey. Carver was not a conservationist in the way we think of his contemporaries, John Muir or Theodore Roosevelt, or even his mentor, Lewis Pamel. They thought of conservation primarily in terms of preserving tracts of land from development. The context of the Carver quote about conservation is that he believed in making the greatest possible use of crops, livestock, and land, and restoring the land so it could produce again. He hated to see anything go to waste. Instead of buying the fertilizers that scientific agriculture told him to buy, he encouraged farmers, you know, as I mentioned, to, to compost. And in lieu of buying paint, he suggested they make it themselves from, soy, from clay and soybeans. He saw self-sufficiency on the land as the best way to, peep, to defeat the Jim Crow laws. Carver thought about the environment holistically, an understanding well before it had reached the mainstream of thought of the interconnectedness between the health of the land and the health of the people who lived on it. Carver promoted saving forests because healthy forests are critical to agriculture, preserving water forest, uh, forest sources, preventing erosion, and the hosting of, um, of pollinators. The contributions Carver made to the environmental movement, therefore, were uh, his ahead of the times ideas about self-sufficiency and sustainability. His campaign was to open people's eyes to the world around them so that they could better understand, as Carver put it, the mutual dependency of the animal, vegetable and mineral kingdoms. And I think his understanding of the role of fungi in ecosystems is fundamental to this concept. The important, uh, importance of Carver's work to diversify Southern agriculture became broadly appreciated when the boll weevil threatened to eliminate cotton in 1914. Because of his advocacy, local agriculture had become more diversified and the farmers who had absorbed his training were able to supplement they previously earned only from cotton with that from other crops. His innovations have been credited with um, the South's economic survival in the early part of the 20th century. After the boll weevil assault came World War I, World War I where there were shortages of crops and food for the war effort, Carver intensified the development of um, uh, alternative uses for the crops that he champions, peanuts, uh, sweet potatoes, cowpeas, and soybeans as well. In all, he developed 300 products from peanuts and 118 from sweet potatoes, in addition to new products from waste materials, including recycled oil. In 1921, the U.S. Um, Congress House Ways and Means Committee asked Carver to testify on a proposed tariff on imported peanuts. Carver's ubiquitous association with peanuts is in many ways due to the explosive testimony he delivered before Congress in favor of a peanut tariff that day. 
He was supposed to just give a brief presentation, but instead he delivered a performance in which he showed off an array of peanut food products, some of which he ate while addressing the lawmakers. Expecting an uneducated backwoodsman, the committee was blown away by the soft-spoken scientist. One of the scientists snarkily asked Carter if he would like some watermelon to go along with his food, but Carver didn't take the bait, telling him that watermelon was fine, but it was a dessert food. His presentation was so compelling that he was told he could speak for as long as he wished, and the Congress, the Congress um, men listened in with rapt attention. Through these efforts, Carver became a recognized leader in the Kemergy movement, the goal of, of which was to put chemistry to work to find non-food uses for agricultural surpluses. One of the prime factors of Kemergy was Henry Ford, who Carver variously addressed in letters as my beloved friend and the greatest of all my inspiring friends. Ford visited Tuskegee in 1938 and Carver was Ford's guest in 1940 at the automaker's Georgia estate. So largely because of the peanut, Carver became one of the dozen or so most famous people in America. He met many famous people, appeared on postage stamps, and was interviewed many times for radio, and is remembered in the names of hundreds of schools. His birthplace has become a national monument, and there are Carver museums in Missouri and also in Tuskegee. He could be forgiven if his fame and fortune and all of his fancy friends led him to forget all about the fungi, but he did not. This graph in the lower left plots Carver's fungal specimens by date of collection. It shows that although Carver made very few or perhaps no collections during the World War I years, his involvement with fungi increased again in the late 1920s and his collecting activities actually peaked in the 1930s. During this period of revitalization of his collection activities, which extended for the rest of Carver's life, he sent more than 1,000 specimens of fungi from Alabama and adjacent areas of the Southwest to colleagues at the USDA National Fungus Collection located in Beltsville, Maryland. Carver's association with Beltsville began through acquaintance with mycologist Paul Miller, who studied fungal diseases of the peanut as a staff member at Beltsville. Miller encouraged Carver to send general collections of fungi to Beltsville, and there's considerable correspondence between Carver and a variety of the mycologists there who identified his specimens. He also, among them, was the um, Cornelius Shear, who was the principal plant pathologist in charge and senior mycologist at the Beltsville facility. And it was Speer, uh, Shear who spearheaded the appointment of Carver as a collaborator in the um, USDA Bureau of Plant Industry Division at Bellsville. And this was an honorary appointment, but one that gave Carver great pleasure. The taxonomic breadth of the specimens Carver sent to Beltsville was broad, over 800 species, but with, again, still maintaining a distinct fo focus on fungi that cause plant disease. Interestingly, only six of his specimens are from the crops that we most uh, closely associate with Carver, that is the peanut and the sweet potato. Miller wrote of Carver, his ability as a collector of rare fungi is almost uncanny. I have been with him on collecting trips where half the specimens found would be, that he found would be the first record of occurrence in the state. It's interesting to note that only three of the specimens he collected were mushrooms. He just wasn't that into them. So although you can read hundreds of articles, literally hundreds, thousands of um, articles of books and websites about Carver, you will find very few discuss his mycological work and even fewer mention his herbarium specimens. This is a shame for mycology and herbaria because it always helps to have celebrities associated with your area of interest. But I think a lack of appreciation of Carver's work with fungi does him a disservice too. One of his own assistants, a person who was devoted to Carver, wrote that he could not find the real scientist in Carver. Also, one of the documents that I read in preparation for this talk described Carter's actual scientific contributions as insignificant. But Carver's collection legacy tells us that this characterization is untrue. The fact that more than 60 of his collections were described as new species alone is not an insignificant accomplishment, especially for someone for whom mycology was not the prime focus of their career. 
This slide includes images of two of the specimens Car Car Carver collected during his later fungal collecting period after the late 1920s. The specimen of Diplodia zee, a cup fungus that attacks cornstarch, is noteworthy to me because it is the only one I have seen whose label still has Carver's original handwritten label. The way the specimen was prepared tells me that Carver was well aware of the typical metadata that should accompany a well-documented specimen, and he noted this information carefully and clearly. We also see that he made a preliminary determination of the fungus, providing the name and the authority, that is the person who originally described the fungus, um, which, and, which um, showed that he, not only that he knew what he was collecting, he, what he was collecting, but he also realized that given the complexity of fungal taxonomy, he suggested that his, um, su that his determination was something that should be confirmed by a specialist in this group. And that's why the question mark. Both of the specimens shown here are quite ample, indicating that Carver understood that it was important to have a large amount of material in order to find all the morphological features of the fungus that might be necessary for characterizing it and determining it. He was not just idly picking up bits of plant material that might have a fungus on them. He was making a serious scientific survey using all the methods that any mycologist would. So I hope I've demonstrated that Carver was a sophisticated fungus collector who approached the documentation of fungal diversity in an intentional and thorough manner, and most definitely made lasting scientific contributions through his mycological work. In the process of talking about George Washington Carver's contributions, I've told you a bit about herbaria and how they are used. I don't want you to think that herbaria can only be used to tell us about the past though. They can tell us about the future as well. Today, there are about 3,400 herbaria in 180 countries around the world, and collectively they hold approximately 400 million specimens that document plant and fungal life on this planet over the past six centuries. Of course, herbaria still serve their original function to document the occurrence of plants and fungi and to provide a reference for their identification and characterization. However, more recent technological advances have allowed us to broaden the way we use these specimens. Understanding the impact of global change on Earth's organisms and ecosystems has become a central focus of biological research today. But documenting such change scientifically is tricky because it requires measurements and observations before and after the change event. But herbarium specimens provide one of the very few tangible sources of data about how plants and fungi lived before industrialization and through each successive period of technological advance since that time. Because plants and fungi are rooted in the ground, they are particularly exposed to the environmental conditions in the place where they grow. As you know, heavy metals such as cadmium and lead and mercury have adverse effects on animal life, even in tiny quantities. And these elements can reach harmful concentrations in our soil and drinking water as a result of unregulated agricultural and industrial processes, as well as inadequate waste disposal methods. Generally less sensitive to these chemicals than animals, plants and fungi absorb heavy metals in the water they take in from their roots or hyphae and are retained in their tissues in herbarium specimens. Therefore, we can use specimens to determine the concentration of heavy metals to get a historical perspective, a perspective on heavy metal pollution in the past. A variety of studies have shown that heavy metal concentrations in herbarium specimens from industrialized regions are highest from times when manufacturing had few pollution control measures, especially in the late 19th century in Europe and North America. A study in Brown University of herbaceous plants in Rhode Island showed that lead concentration in plant specimens decreased um, during the period between 1846 and 2015 as more efficient em uh, emission controls were applied to manufacturing in the area. Interesting though, lead levels were also high in plants from offshore Block Island, 13 miles from the mainland, where there was no significant industry, indicating the breadth of the area that the pollution affected. In, in the 1900s, scientists discovered that gene sequences could be recovered from the tissue of herbarium specimens. And since that time, the process has been refined to require smaller amounts of tissue and the success rate has increased for, even for very old specimens. 
Until recently, most of the DNA-based research using herbarium specimens contributed to delimiting species and constructing phylogenies or family trees to help us understand how organisms related to one another. But now we have new and more powerful tools for sequencing gene DNA known as next generation sequencing, which makes it possible to sequence all the genes in an organism, that is to characterize its genome. And these techniques are now being applied to DNA recovered from herbarium specimens. Um, some of the current projects that, are, that have used this technique uh, in plants are those that are looking for the genes that are related to the development of nitrogen fixation, drought tolerance, and also the traits that make certain uh, plants invas invasive. Here's an example of how DNA uh, has been used um, from herbarium specimens. Uh, fungi has been used to reconstruct part of the story of one of the most consequential plant diseases in history. Phytophthora infestans is an oomycete plant pathogen, um, and it caused the potato blight fungi famine. Oomycetes are actually not classified as fungi anymore, but traditionally collections of these organisms are part of fungal herbaria. The disease first occurred in the United States in 1843 and then subsequently spread into Europe and Ireland in 1845. Um, in a study by Jean Restaino and colleagues at North Carolina State University, herbarium specimens of Phytophthora were used to address several important research questions, including understanding the life history of the potato blight fungus, identifying the strain that caused the famine-related outbreaks and where they came from, determining the spatial scale of the, of the strain and um, where it originated, and also reconstructing the genetic structure and evolutionary history of this pathogen and its sister lineages and how the virulence has changed uh, over time. And what they found was that the, uh, the, 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 the fungus that caused the potato blight, uh, the famine in Ireland, originated in the Andes, which is not surprising since that's where the potato originated. The strain still exists and, in fact, is still very common, but, of course, plant breeding programs have led to the development of potatoes that are resistant to it. However, they've also discovered that the strain of Phytophthora that caused the famine has become more virulent over time. So plant breeders will have to continue to create new, disease, new resistant strains in order to stay ahead of the potato blight. All this information derived from centuries old are preserved herbarium specimens. I've shown you images of a number of herbarium specimens in this talk, and I was able to do so because for about 20 years or so, my herbarium and those around the world have been engaged in digitizing their specimens and making the data available online. Specimen digitization is the process of capturing images of the specimens and transcribing their label data into a database and then sharing the results online. Today, there are about 80 million digitized specimens from the world herbaria that are shared through various data portals. In the US, most of the digitization work has been done in the past decade, thanks to a special funding program from the National Science Foundation. This practice has opened up many new uses for herbarium specimens. For example, this map plots the location of herbarium specimens from Brazil, um, overlaying uh, map layers which that show the distribution of the Amazonian forests and also the location of the terrible fires there in the summer of 2019, so allowing a visualization of what plant biodiversity may have been lost through that environmental catastrophe. Estimates suggest that up to 50% of the still undescribed species of plants and fungi um, may, may actually be represented in herbaria, but are either misidentified or are in the unidentified backlog that almost every herbarium holds. There's great interest in the moment in, in applying machine learning techniques, such as computer vision and data mining, to digitize herbarium specimens. This work is at an early stage of development, but holds great promise as a technology that can build on digitized specimens to broaden the use of, broaden the use of herbarium specimens even further. Preliminary attempts to apply machine learning to plant identification from herbarium specimens have shown that algorithms can match images of specimens of unknown identity to a reference set of specimens with an accuracy rate of about 85 to 90 percent. 
and further study the algorithms and refinement of the processes will likely make the rate of uh, correct matching even higher. So if we're able to combine machine learning based on image recognition with mining of descriptive data from published literature and gene sequence data, we may one day have a very powerful tool for plant identification and fungi as fungal and identification as well. Through the NSF funded digitization program, most of the herbarium specimens of fungi held in US herbaria today have been digitized. These uh, data are shared through, um, through uh, the Mycology Collections Portal, a resource which is available to everyone. There are between two and three million specimen records available through the Michael Portal um, from which, from well over a hundred herbaria. Most are from the US, most of those herbaria are located in the US, but there are a number of non-US collections included as well. On the top right, uh, on the right is a query form, which you can use to enter search terms. You can search by the scientific name or when or where by whom the specimen was collected. I use this extensive, this index extensively in finding carver specimens for this talk. You might find the Michael Portal useful in your study of Texas fungi. A search indicates that there are records for almost 40,000 specimens of fungi from Texas in the Michael Portal. You might also be interested to know that Texas has about 30 herbaria with about 3.7 million herbarium specimens. It ranks fifth nationwide in, by, of states in the number of herbaria and specimens. The largest is the herbarium at the University of Texas in Austin, but the herbarium of the Botanical Research Institute in Fort Worth, Fort Worth is also quite large. Many herbarium welcome volunteers, so if you're interested in helping your local herbarium, they will very likely be glad to have you. That's all I have for you tonight. I hope that I helped you see George Washington Carver as a more multi-dimensional figure than maybe you did before and to appreciate what Herbaria can teach us um, about him and about many other things as well. Um, thanks, thanks very much. Excellent, that was amazing. Thank you so much for that beautiful oh. presentation. So many, so much to learn and um, I wanted to see if um, anybody out there has questions. We can take some questions now. Mostly just seeing lots of great comments. <laughs> so thorough. You covered so much ground and it's wonderful to know that, um, you know, we have access to some of these resources. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, you know, I wasn't aware of, of uh, some of them Mm -hmm. um but yeah i i find the um you know the digitation process like that seems like a large big arduous path yeah <laughs> and, uh, it, it is it is a large it is a, a, a an arduous job but but um it's well worth doing because it's the ultimate way to kind of share your collections with the world. You know, you, not everyone can come and visit. And although most herbaria do send specimens on loan, they only send them to other herbaria. They don't send them to just anybody around the world. Um, uh, so, you know, it's a great way to be able to see what's in a collection, especially if you're not able to travel. The main reason we started it was so that we could repatriate data to collections uh, that were made outside the US, you know, in countries um, where that didn't have the benefit of specimens we did, but it really, it benefits everyone. So um, yeah, it's been a, a long, and, and fungi are especially tricky. Vascular uh, plants glued to paper are pretty easy. It's almost like an assembly line thing, but, but mushrooms are harder. But, um, and arguably you get less information from the dried fungus. It's much more important to also digitize along with that images of the living collection and spore prints and notes and things like that. But still, we have a reference now that everyone can, can use. Yeah. Um, this question is from the chat. What are some of the conditions necessary to provide uh, preserve dried specimens? Some of the conditions. Well, um, one thing about dried fungi is that they um, will absorb moisture again. And once they're, once they're dried in, in a humid climate, and I, in the New York summer, before we moved into a climate controlled building, 
we did find that in the humid summer that our specimens and fungal specimens became kind of rubbery. So it's a problem. And then once that happens, once they begin to get moisture in them, then they, then they can easily get a fungal infection. Um, so what you have to do is keep them as best you can in, in low, low humidity conditions. They have to be dried very well. And then immediately after drying, they need to be stored, you know, in a, in a steel cabinet and a climate controlled room. Some people will use silica gel, a little bit of silica gel in, in a bag if they don't have, you know, a, a facility where they can control the humidity. But, um, but that's, they are not easy. Um, not only are they subject to humidity, but the little beetles love to eat them. The little beetles mm -hmm. called dermestids can completely wipe out a collection. And it's, um, uh, yeah, it's pretty sad uh, to see. So it takes, it, takes some, it takes some effort to maintain a fungal collection for sure. Um, what is the rate of loss of the sample of the samples? Like someone asked, like, did some of the specimens just end up crumbling then? Um, so we are very careful. Most in herbarium would be very careful to keep them in um, a kind of container where they won't crumble. So a mushroom, for example, if you put a mushroom in a paper packet, it will almost certainly crumble. But we invest in boxes. Very, it becomes very expensive to maintain all these boxes, but we buy boxes in a variety of sizes and we store the specimens in those so that they, they aren't crushed. Um, inevitably, mushrooms, especially little ones, do, do get broken, but that doesn't mean they're not useful. You can still you know, look at the fragments and pull, a pack, pull bits out and look at spores and things like that. If you know what you're doing, you can still, you can kind of reconstruct it. Uh, but, um, but yeah, there, believe me, there's, there's an awful lot of herbarium specimens that um, someone made with great effort and good intent and are not very useful anymore just because they've, they've not had the benefit of the right kind of storage. Yeah, it seems like it can get overwhelming. Um, along those lines about uh, do they want do herbariums want donations of samples like yes um, herbaria generally do I mean each every herbarium is different and many have constraints most herbaria are not very well funded they may not have enough space they may not have enough staff to deal with new accessions however um, in in as a general principle uh, herbaria want to grow and they want to reflect. It's very important that everyone keep collecting because we have to keep documenting the, 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 the um, we have to keep documenting the, the vegetation of the earth because we're in the midst of a huge change event now. And this is really, we, we, we need to keep, we need to keep, um, you know, sampling and knowing what's, what's there. So um, it's, there's a number of things a herbarium would ask before accepting samples. They'd want to know that the collections were made legally and ethically, so that if permits were required, that permits were obtained. Um, they would also want to make sure that they, they don't probably don't care so much about the identification, frankly. They would want to know that the specimens had proper documentation, so it was clear where it was collected, when and by whom. And of course, in the case of fungi, it's very important to have notes and photographs of the fungus in the living collection. Um, but it's always good to ask first, but many herbaria would be delighted to have well-made, properly documented and legally collected specimens. Um, so when you volunteer at an herbarium, are you gonna be, what kind of work would you be doing? Would you be going through the identifications no. or? So our, we've had, um, volunteers of all sorts. We do have a few volunteers who um, do plant identifications. They had experience in that and they like doing it. Um, some people like to just take pictures. They just like to see a whole lot of different plants and they like to take pictures of them. Other people like to do the preparation. They like to um, glue specimens to, uh, you know, to sheets of paper. They like to put specimens in boxes. Um, uh, they have specialties. People like certain types of organisms that require special techniques like um, slime molds. Slime molds are very tricky and different to preserve. Um, tiny boxes and you glue them in place, but some people love to do that. People who like to work with their hands 
often like the challenges of making neat and tidy specimens. It's a, a little bit like a craft project. We also have lots of people who volunteer without ever leaving their homes by transcribing specimen labels um, uh, in various um, programs. One that's very commonly used is called is Notes from Nature, which is part of the Zooniver Zooniverse Citizen Science web portal, where you can log on and help herbaria around the country, uh, around the world actually, um, digitize their specimens by looking at the label and transcribing the information from the label into the database. So there's many different ways that you can, um, that you can volunteer. Um, I have a question. So for, for someone that's um, may not be in academia or be, be studying or like uh, a mycologist, you know, there's this movement of citizen scientists yeah. like, that are doing a lot of really great work. Like what would be the process for someone that, you know, is amateur and very mm -hmm. enthusiastic to be able to check out a, prof, uh, a specimen from a herbarium? Well, many, many amateur mycologists have visited my herbarium to look at specimens and um, they simply have to write and ask. Um, they probably have to explain what, they, what they're looking at and why, but uh, most, most herbaria will be glad to let you come and look at specimens. That's really what we're there for. Um, they don't really, they, most of them can't afford the staff to just open completely to the public but um, if you write, if you contacted them and, uh, uh, and, and told them why you wanted to come, I'm almost positive that they would make arrangements for you to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can DNA be extracted from specimens? And I guess, is there like yes. a time limit on the, how long well, DNA can be extracted? Yeah, so um, it probably depends a bit on the preservation but it's gotten much easier over time. At first, it seemed as though DNA extraction only worked well from very recently collected specimens, things that were preserved, dried very, you know, very quickly and so forth. But um, you hear less and less about people being unable to get any DNA. In fact, People have told me if you want to badly enough, you can get DNA out of just about anything, just a matter of how much effort you want to put in it. But um, I'm not sure that's absolutely true. But on the other hand, I do think there, in general, it's gotten much easier. Uh, the techniques have gotten better. You need less and less actual DNA uh, in order to, to do the sequencing. So we routinely allow it. Uh, we don't allow it uh, on specimens that are very small and fragmented, but um, it's pretty rare for us not to allow someone to sample the DNA from a specimen. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, do Herbaria have any associations with GIS-based programs or apps like iNaturalist? So we have talked a lot about linking to iNaturalist. Um, in fact, we've had, I've been part of several different meetings where we talked about linking um, uh, uh, observations of fungi through iNaturalist to the Myco portal. I know that we had it working with, um, what's the other one? There's, there's iNaturalist um, Myco. Mushroom Observer. Mushroom Observer, right, right. Um, and I know that, that, we, that they were in discussions with, with iNaturalist. It's a very natural uh, progression to make and it can be done. Um, whether it's actually been implemented yet, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but I know that there's great interest on both sides in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, are you all, um, like as far as the digitation process, um, <clears throat> as far as technology goes, like what, uh, and this may be for like tech, techie, techie folks, what type of um, uh, partners do you all work with to, to do that machine learning? and uh, oh. pattern recognition. Yeah, so um, a number of collaborations are with data scientists at, like at universities. At the Garden, we actually uh, collaborated with people at Cornell Tech. Um, the, the Technical College of Cornell is located in New York City. And we've actually had some help from some researchers at Google as well. Um, but there are others who have taken it farther than we have. We're trying, we're trying to increase our footprint there. But um, a lot of it has come from university collaborations between, you know, a data. It's interesting that, that people in data science and uh, machine learning are 
are eager for new and interesting applications to work on. Um, and of course, we're eager to have those partnerships too. It's mostly just a question of being able to find the right person who's interested at the right time. So um, uh, I, 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 I expect there'll be many more fruitful collaborations there um, because uh, there is something, and it's true about using um, data from specimens, from herbarium specimen data, occurrence species, any of species occurrence data, it's it's much more meaningful than just using, you know, banking records or some other kind of thing. You know, you feel like you doing a project like this, you're actually contributing potentially to conservation and the good of the planet as well. So, so yeah, it's it's an area that we could use a lot more collaboration though. Yeah, that, I mean that just sounds it's pretty amazing to me to think about like people were just kind of collecting these for various reasons throughout the years. And then all of a sudden, like as computer technology and calculations through that, or uh, the calculation abilities through that kind of increased over the years, like all of a sudden this massive data set that exists globally is kind of coming back into focus uh, yeah. and has kind of taken on a whole new set of meaning and, and use to it, which is yeah. like, that was not even conceivable back when people no. first started like doing these classifications. And, and you, you've perfectly summarized what's so exciting about this, what, what people like me and people, well, pe me and people like me find so absolutely, you know, fascinating about this whole thing is that, 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 yeah, something that was done for a completely different reason has these new uses and it's, it's just, you know, Incredible, yeah. Incredible. You shared the uh, the potato famine example of why this is so important. Are there any new kind of discoveries that are coming into the fore that that you can share as well? Um, that 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 sort of are in discovery. Yeah, um, I don't know of any. Usually, you don't find these things out till you're published, till they're published, but. Um, I do know that there's an awful lot of work going on 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 understanding how things, um, you know, how pathogenicity works, how resistance works, um, and more importantly, how resistance breaks down, which is what you know we really need to know. Um, a lot of it is centered, you know, about around the the traits, the traits that characterize an organism and that allow it to function where it functions. And this is giving us huge insights into the whole mycorrhizal association, and um, and looking at the gene level, you know, we're finding out just what this fungal network is capable of. You know, they found <laughs> they found genes belonging to salmon in trees. And the only way that probably could happen was somehow through the through the fungal transport network, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think the, um, the 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 soil, what's happening in the soil, uh, what's happening in uh, in the interaction of tissues between a pathogen and a and a a, a host and a pathogen are real areas where there's a tremendous amount of knowledge still to come, and it's absolutely critical. Uh, because we are always just a couple stages ahead of a devastating plant disease. You know, this time it was COVID. It was a virus that started in bats or something and came to humans. But, but a devastating disease of our foodstuffs could have just as much um, an of an implications implications for our lives. Mm -hmm. So um, the more we understand about those relationships, and the more we understand about helping keeping our soil healthy, so that we can continue to grow food, you know, the better off we'll be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love the part uh, going back to uh, Dr. Carver, just um, how he had that holistic approach to soil ecology mm -hmm. towards agriculture. It's very much like, you know, like you said, it's very much like come back, I don't know, it, into style, if you will. But like, right. you know, I think it's just a more accurate representation of what's going on and thinking about right. things from an ecological perspective perspective is so valuable and it, i think it's pretty amazing that you know he had that kind of mindset so long ago um and yeah. it's kind of a shame that people didn't listen to him more <laughs> i know i know it's such a shame and it all came from just you know the very practical experience of of helping people live their day-to-day -day lives you know uh, mm -hmm. sustainability starting at home and then building out you know um so yeah yeah we we should have we should have listened to him more for sure <laughs> Yes. Uh, do you do you feel like that um, 
you know, this, the sort of work that you do, like it has an influence or like it pushes itself into kind of like where, you know, like uh, the decisions are being made, like when things are continuing down this like hyper industrial path. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a push at all? Like, you know, when these new discoveries are made and when this new, you know, here's your data, we yeah. can see it all now. <laughs> like, let's, let's, uh, uh you know like can we start to think a little bit more holistically you know do you think that it has impact uh, i mean there there is sure you know we we all have benefited from scientific research and some of it fairly recent the covid vaccine being an excellent case in point how easily they were able to develop that based on study of, of mrna and so forth that's probably one of the one of the most rapid kind of um mass implementations of a scientific discovery in the not too distant past that uh, that I've seen. But there's always a lag, you know, there's always a lag time between scientific discovery and policy. Um, it, uh, it, it seems like it's just the way it is. And of course, there's always the political factor that that adds in too. And po political, not just in terms of the sort of horrible polarization we have in our country right now, but just what's expedient to get the job done. You know, the scientific solution, the, 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 the well-reasoned um, sound scientific solution to a problem isn't always the fastest solution. And most times we're looking for a fast solution because a politician wants a quick win. Um, people demand change, you know. Um, so I, I wish that it were true, and I would hope. I'm always optimistic, you know, that maybe we'll get to a place where um, where scientific research is is given more credence um, and and it, and it has impact faster. Uh, all we can keep, all we can do is, you know, keep trying. And certainly, the climate is seems a little bit more favorable than it was, you know, not too long ago. So, you know, we'll keep hoping and keep pushing. Scientists bear some responsibility here. I think we're all learning to talk to people uh, mm -hmm. in a much, in a way that is easier understood. We're not um, assuming that people have to all have the same, you know, educational experiences in order to understand what the, what the impact of it is. I think a huge amount of effort goes now into science communication and outreach where it didn't used to. That's part of every scientist's job now. If you want to get a grant, if you want to get a promotion, you've got to demonstrate that you um, uh, are making your work accessible to the public. So that should help too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's, you know, seems to be like more of an emph emphasis, you know, in the ecological sort of world, like about you know, by, we need more biodiversity and, um, you know, and, and even the agricultural process. Um, and is, is there like within like herbarium, is there like a way that this has been visualized? Like, you know, this is the biodiversity that we had, you know, like, can we see like what is becoming extinct or what uh, things are sort of yes. like be becoming obsolete because of our continued yeah. path of like um, industrialization. Yeah, I mean, that that's a major use of these digitized data. I was hinting at it a little bit in the picture that I showed of the distribution of um, specimens in Brazil and the forest layers. That was taken from a GIS application. And what you can do is you can do modeling. And so, um, you can lay, layer in this GIS application, the distribution of the organisms, you can layer soil temperature, rainfall, every kind of you know, e uh, environmental layer that you can imagine that we have data for, you can pile on top of one another. And then you can develop a profile for each species of where it grows and what the conditions are where it grows. And you can characterize the species based on that. So this species only grows in area where the salinity in the soil is, you know, a certain amount, it gets a certain amount of rainfall, the annual temperature is in this range. So then you can, in these same programs, you, be, you can um, change, you can fiddle with some of those elements. What if 
the salinity in the soil rises by 2%? What if the rainfall decreases? You know, these different things. And you can see where, where the, the distributions of the organisms change. So we call this, you know, um, um, ecological modeling. And uh, it's great for predictive value of, of how things are gonna change in the future. And it's not perfect, it's an estimation. It really, once you make an estimation, you have to really go and kind of try to look for uh, the change and maybe do some growth studies, you know, back it up with something. But you, it gives you an idea if, if indeed, if you look at an area and you say, okay, sea level is going to rise a quarter of an inch, you can make predictions about what plants and animals are going to disappear based on modeling. And it's proving to be a very important tool. And the full sole basis for that is past occurrence. You know, that's the, and, and you could not do that if you didn't know where those organisms grew in the past. Wow. So important. <laughs> yeah. Um, you had mentioned in our discussion on email that um, you recently published a book. Uh -huh. uh, do you want to share with the audience a little bit about that and some information? Sure. We could put that in the chat, like where if people are interested in digging in deeper. Okay. So the book is called Herbaria, Collectively Saving Plant and Fungal Biodiversity. And it's published by Timber Press. It was published last December. And um, you can get it uh, at, um, you know, through Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, if somebody out there would like me to send a copy to their local library, um, just send me the name of the library. I have some extra copies and I'd be happy to send it. So um, if you want to um, put in the chat or uh, I can get my email address pretty easily. If you just Google me, you can find it. Um, because I would be glad to donate books to libraries as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, that would be a great one for the new Central Library of Austin. Uh huh. We'll reach yeah, out for to sure. people that um, are over there and see if they, they would like to add that to the collection. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to send it. Just have to know where and where and to whom. Okay. Um, so one more question. This one's a little bit off topic. Uh, someone was wondering could, if you could tell us about how you faced off uh, armed gunmen in South America <laughs> during a liverwort collecting trip. <laughs> I don't think I ever did that. Oh. It would make a great story. I know, right? I <laughs> remember collecting. So my husband is a mycologist too, Roy Holly. And, and in the late eight, 1980s, I collected with him in Colombia, we were we were based in Medellin. That time, Medellin was kind of a dangerous place because of all the narco narco traficantes, and we were going out collecting one day, and we got pulled over at a checkpoint by a bunch of young and very bored-looking soldiers who had big guns. And they wanted to know what we were doing, and they did not believe that we were collecting mushrooms and liverwort. <laughs> Um, and I stood there shaking, hoping they would let us go, and they did. So if that was facing them off, then I guess maybe so. But mostly, <laughs> I was just wondering if we would live to get back to Medellin. They they weren't all in the end. They decided that we weren't all that interesting, and they let us go on their way. So mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm afraid I don't have those kinds of adventures. Um, <laughs> too bad for the point of the story, but. Uh, <laughs> that didn't make the edit of uh, narco. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although watching that did um, did bring back some memories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good series. I see the note about the library, and I'm I'm quickly sending myself an an email about it. Yeah, and I can send you the chat file. Oh, would you? That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Well, do we have any other questions? Oh, well, it's yeah. been really fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, thank you so much for putting sure. that together. I really Pleasure. hope that um, uh, you can reuse this presentation. I'm sure more people yeah. here. <laughs> um, it was so much good information. It was very cool to see your Texas connection. I didn't realize 
Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's when I'm all like, Texas. You know? I know, but still, <laughs> it's fun. It's, you know, it's just Texas is a special place in my heart. Um, yeah. And uh, well, maybe one day I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to <laughs> yeah. your presentations in, in the flesh. Seems like you guys do a lot of cool stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. We'd love to meet you in person if you're ever in Austin. Um, we can go check out the uh, herbaria. Yeah. Maybe do a tour uh -huh. with a group of folks. Uh, uh -huh. Check out the UT collection. Mm -hmm. That would be great fun. collection. Yep. <laughs> so if you're on here, let us know. Um, okay. But yeah, we appreciate your time and enthusiasm on this topic. It's opened up my eyes even I'm more. Glad. I'm glad. It was George nice to meet all of you. Yeah. It was a pleasure. <laughs> great. Okay. Well, all um, right. Well, good night, everyone. Does anyone else uh, have any other comments before we go? And be sure to check out our next fundraiser event, Octopus Project. <laughs> like, hi, Faye, hi, Faye, <laughs> Octopus. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Okay. Thanks right. for coming tonight, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.